Good morning, everyone. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you and your loved ones are healthy and safe. My name is Randy Bell, and I'm the director of the Global Energy Center at the Atlanta Council. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us today for Energy Source Innovation Stream, where we aim to highlight new energy technologies with the potential to reshape the global energy system. Today is a very special day for Innovation Stream as we mark our 20th episode uh, with Elizabeth Freitim, the head of business development at Nikola Motor Company. Before we get started, two administrative details. First, you can follow us on Twitter at AC Global Energy and use the hashtag innovation stream. Second, after Elizabeth's presentation, you can submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. And we'll try to get to as many of these questions as we can. If you're watching on another platform like YouTube, unfortunately, we cannot take your questions. So please let me welcome Elizabeth to the Atlanta Council. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I really appreciate being here. I'm excited to, to do the presentation. So maybe let's let's start off with the video. I want to show you all how just how real this is. Roger. Well, while we're waiting for the video, I think I think we're I think we're having a, a technical difficulty. While we're waiting for the video, um, how has uh, COVID uh, changed? That's very, very cool. Uh, it's great to see that, uh, great to see that uh, real, great to see these technologies that we're highlighting actually real. So how, how has COVID changed Nicola's uh, strategy? You know, we are still full steam ahead. Um, I guess that's the one blessing in being uh, pre-revenue is that, you know, we're just, we're just moving forward as fast as we can. Um, you know, a few interruptions in the supply chain, but for the most part, um, we're still moving forward and, and pretty close to on schedule. That's awesome. That's great. Well, why don't, why don't we start the presentation? I know I'm going to have a bunch of questions and I suspect the audience will as well. So, uh, Roger, if you could start the presentation, we'll, we'll get going with this. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, about, about the strategy and about the technology. Fantastic, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone, or I guess good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, again, really excited to be here and, and looking forward to the discussion. If you go, we are Nikola Motor and we are um, focused on zero emission vehicles and are transforming the future of transportation. And so if you go to the next slide, this gives an overview of our product lineup. And I'm gonna start on the, on the far right, which is our power sports division. Um, so kind of like the traditional off-road vehicles, the side-by-sides, as well as we have a watercraft. And then if, on the left-hand side of the vehicle, or left-hand side of the slide, sorry, is um, our main focus, which is the, the transportation you know, on-road vehicles. And we wanted to solve the issue of the chicken and the egg where you know, people didn't want to build the vehicles until there was infrastructure and no infrastructure until there was vehicles. So we're tackling both. And I'll dig into the semi trucks and the infrastructure um, in the presentation. So let me tell you a little bit about the Badger, which is the pickup truck that you see there. Now, while obviously it could be um, a personal vehicle, we actually have the industry and commercial uses in mind. So um, you can get 300 miles on all battery. You can double that um, with fuel cell as well as kind of increase your towing power. And there is a power export capability. So for example, if you're a service truck or utility, utility truck, something like that, um, you can run tools off of there, an air compressor or any kind of power tools. So we're very excited about that um, and hope to have an announcement here in the very near, near future about um, which OEM we're going to be working with to bring that, that vehicle to life. 
we go to the next slide, please. This is our semi truck lineup. And, you know, a lot of times when you're thinking about zero emission future, especially at the heavy duty um, class of vehicles, there's this discussion about is it battery or is it fuel cell? We really believe it's both and are building batteries with or building vehicles with both technologies. Each one has strengths depending on the duty cycle, the operating environment, the needs of the, the fleet. So our first vehicle to market will be a battery electric um, vehicle. And you can see there the range is up to 300 miles. Of course, that's impacted the same as diesel, by the way, um, on what the operating conditions are. So do you have heavy payloads? Is there a lot of um, hilly terrain? Those types of things. And then um, soon after that, we'll be unveiling our fuel cell vehicle. Now you can see there kind of the key differentiator between the two is the range. Um, but fuel cell vehicles can actually excel in a couple of other um, environments, even if you are driving shorter lengths of haul. So if you do, again, if you do have a heavy payload, um, fuel cell technology is lighter than battery. But also if you have what we call a quick turn application or you're double shifting the vehicle. So one driver goes out, he comes back, he hops out, another driver hops in, and you don't have those hours of recharge. To refuel a fuel cell truck is very similar to a diesel experience. So it's kind of 10, 15 minutes versus the several hours that it is right now for battery. Now, recognizing battery technology is improving exponentially, um, you know, we'll see those times shorten. Um, still, the quick turn of the fuel cell um, is, a, is a big strength for that technology. The other thing I want to point out about our fuel cell technology, because it's different than some of the designs we've seen in the past, is that the power from the fuel cell will go directly into the motors. So a lot of past designs, it went from the fuel cell into the battery, then into the motor. And the problem with that design is that often it can't keep up with the demands of the truck. So for us, the, the energy will go generally into, into straight into the motors. It can also go to recharge the battery if possible, because there is still a battery in a fuel cell design. It's just much smaller. And so that's another a good point to point out, whether you're talking about an electric, a battery electric truck or a fuel cell electric truck, they're both electric drivetrains. So the drivetrains are basically identical. It's just where you're storing and generating the energy from. Next slide, please. This is another area um, that I think is a key strength of ours. And I was at Walmart for 10 years before this um, in, in our transportation division, leading sustainability for the supply chain division. And you know, as I looked at how technology was evolving, it was very incremental, it was very evolutionary. And the fact that we are designing from a clean sheet has allowed us to really leap for, leapfrog forward in technology. So you can see here, you know, our, our dashboard and instrument panel is much more like you would see in some of the more advanced vehicles. You hopefully can see the, the animations as it goes through the different options um, in the infotainment and instrument cluster. You have the traditional buttons of HVAC, music, phone control, um, your telematics can be in that screen. We'll have onboard diagnostics where the driver or technician can actually dig into whatever faults the, the truck is throwing straight from the vehicle. We can also um, broadcast those to the mechanics uh, back at a home base or, you know, NICLA, depending on the, on the fault that's happening. On the instrumentation cluster, you can see we can put the information that the driver needs at that time right in front of them. So they don't need to look to the side if they're coming up to an important decision point in turn by turn navigation, or if one of the ADOS features um, is activating. So if you have an adaptive cruise control, you know they can easily look down on the instrumentation cluster and see what's happening with the vehicle at any time. So this again is something that I think is a, is a clear advantage um, for Nikola is our, our software and controls architecture because we're not retrofitting on, on a legacy system. Go to the next slide, please. As I mentioned, we're also gonna be building fuel stations and our 
mandate as a company is zero emissions and we want to be that from energy creation through energy consumption and so this is a rendering of an on-site fuel fueling concept where you know we will contract with as much zero emission and renewable energy as possible that energy will convert um, water into hydrogen through electrolysis we'll have at least a day, day and a half worth of storage on site of hydrogen. And that's important for a couple of reasons. One, obviously resiliency. So, you know, if the grid goes down, if we can't um, generate hydrogen, um, you know, we have that backup. But the other important key to that is the economics of, of the operation. So the fact that we have on-site storage allows us to take interruptible power from the utility and that significantly lowers the cost um, for our energy coming into the into the um, system. We are working with um, other hydrogen manufacturers around the world, including our competitors, our main competitors, Toyota and Hyundai at this point, as well as several of the large gas providers to to come to a standard for fueling. And so that's gonna be really important for our customers that they will know that they can pull up to any hydrogen station and fuel and not have to worry about different protocols or different connectors, any of that. You'll also see on the bottom that, you know, we're really wanting to drive the hydrogen um, and zero emission economy. And so we will of course have high, heavy duty fueling, but we'll also have light duty fueling as well as high speed charging um, for all classes of vehicles on these public stations. Next slide, please. It sounds like we're ambitious and we are, um, but we're not doing this on our own. We're building partnerships with world class organizations that are just as passionate about this transformation as we are. And you can see on there we have several um, tier one automotive suppliers. Um, and many of these, by the way, are also investors in Nikola. So we are all sharing and moving towards this vision together. Aveco on the top left-hand corner is um, a world-class global manufacturer of on-road vehicles. They're part of the CNH or Case New Holland family. Bosch, I'm sure you all are very familiar with, and they've been a partner with us um, almost since the beginning. Hanwha, one of the largest solar panel producers and one of the largest solar project developers in the world. Um, Wabco, Mali, both tier one automotive suppliers. CAT is a service partner of ours. Nell um, is one of the largest electrolyzer producers. Um, and then the remainder, AVL, Meritor, Pratt Miller, EDAG, ETEL Design, again, um, tier one automotive suppliers that are partners with us. Next slide, please. We are also um, pioneering a very different business model um, than what you've seen in the past for our fuel cell electric trucks. Our battery electric trucks are a little bit different. Um, so maybe let me start, start there. They're not different from, from what's um, currently in the market because we do think that'll be more of a traditional model of selling or leasing the vehicle. And of course we have warranty and maintenance with that. Um, but in most of those cases, our customers will be putting the infrastructure on their own properties. And so we believe they will own and operate most of that infrastructure. On the fuel cell side, again, because we're looking at these more public fueling stations and new technology, um, we plan to offer a bundled lease. And so that includes the vehicle, the maintenance and the fuel in a per mile charge. And so we're pretty excited about that. Our customers are excited about that, especially in the early years where it reduces some of their risk um, on residual values. Next slide, please. This is our roadmap to commercialization. And you can see we are moving as fast as we can um, to get these vehicles out. There've been a lot of um, recent developments, especially in the, in the US moving um, to move to zero emission vehicles for medium and heavy duty. California passed its act rule and um, recently we had an MOU signed by 15 states to adopt those same rules. So, um, you know, we're looking to get these vehicles out as fast as we can. 
The battery electric vehicle is going to come to the U.S. next year in 2021. Those early vehicles will be built by our partner Aveco in Ulm, Germany at their factory. And then um, subsequent to that, we're going to start, of course, we're going to start um, ramping up production of the battery electric truck. And at the same time, um, building our beta and gamma fuel cell trucks. And both will go into full production here um, in 2023 as we complete our own uh, manufacturing plant in Coolidge, Arizona. We actually just broke ground on that on July 23rd. So we're pretty excited. Things are, things are becoming real. Um, so I think that's my last slide and I look forward to discussion. Elizabeth, thank you so much. That's really, really fascinating. Um, as we, we discussed uh, beforehand, uh, there are a lot of questions uh, that are coming in from the audience, which is great. Awesome. So uh, remember, uh, everyone use the Q&A function in Zoom, um, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, but you know, I have two questions to get started with. So first about the video. So what, which truck was that in the video? Was that the battery electric vehicle or uh, the battery or the fuel cell? That was the fuel cell electric vehicle. That was one okay. of our Nikola twos. Um, and it's an alpha truck that, um, you know, we're doing a lot of testing and learning from right now. It's on the track um, that we're learning from, but yeah, that one is the fuel cell. Okay. And that's real. That's something that, you know, if I, if I were to come out to Arizona, I, I could, I could get in it. Is that, that's, do you allow people like me to get in it? That's a, a more interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> No, absolutely. Absolutely. We do. It's not street legal. So it's either we've got a, a fairly large um, piece of property here. So we, we go around the property as well. But um, and then we also take it out to the track. That's yeah. Fantastic. And hopefully you saw hopefully you saw we actually hauled a load of beer for Anheuser-Busch um, late last year. So that was pretty exciting. Yep. Yep. Well, I'm inviting myself out uh, to, to get a, a drive in it as soon as I can travel again. So uh, <laughs> absolutely. I'll, I'll send you an email. Yeah. With a mask. <laughs> I'll send you a note like an hour before I show up. <laughs> Perfect. So, Perfect. There, there are a lot, a lot of really good questions coming in, but one more from me, which is really about the, the hydrogen ecosystem um, mm -hmm. and, and ensuring that there is a, enough quantity of, of, uh, zero or low car carbon hydrogen to actually um, make to scale up uh, the low carbon trucking. Now, um, I think it's fa it's fantastic that you're thinking about not um, the, the chicken or the egg, but the chicken and egg simultaneously. Um, Cooking the omelet. Yeah, the, yes. And, uh, <laughs> it's a, that, that song, The Mother and Child Reunion, um, the, uh, from Paul, Paul Simon. Yeah. Um, but the, um, the egg and the chicken in the, in the, in the dish. Um, but uh, as, as an aside, I think I'm getting lost in my own method. Um, <laughs> I love it. The, the question that, you know, we've been doing some work at the Global Energy Center thinking through um, how much hydrogen you can actually produce from renewable power. Um, and just there, there's a, a, a lot of limitations on, on green hydrogen, at least right now, because there's just not that much um, in the scheme of things, renewable power installed globally. So how do you think about getting enough hydrogen to actually incentivize people wanting to use uh, use these trucks to make it uh, make it viable, not, not necessarily from a, a commercial perspective, but just from a logistical perspective? How do you generate that much hydrogen? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I want to I want to clarify, there's a, um, a saying that one of our customer uses that I that I love, and it's it's don't let perfect get in the way of good. Mm -hmm. um, and so while our end goal, of course, is to be as green, as zero emission, as renewable as possible, we understand that that might not be possible right off the bat. So there may be areas where we have to take power off of the grid um, in order to generate that hydrogen. But we want to find, you know, continue to move towards the best sources of hydrogen. So, um, you know, we're working with um, suppliers and producers of hydrogen on those supply chains. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen there is a huge amount of momentum around the world right now on hydrogen. Um, you know, just how do we produce it in general? How do we transport it? But how do we make it as green as possible? And so I think it's going to be important as we go ahead, you know, to really understand that life cycle um, impact of the various pathways um, and, you know, just continue to work on those to, to make them better. Yeah. Um, do you do you think that 
all of the hydrogen will be produced using electrolyzers, or do you think you'll produce use uh, you know, so-called blue hydrogen produced using, using gas and steam methane reforming with carbon capture? Yeah, um, we are looking at all of those pathways. Um, and as you know, there's things like, you know, do you use renewable natural gas instead of, um, you know, fossil natural gas? There is some, um, there are some issues with that because sometimes with renewable natural gas, you don't know what's in it. And so how do you clean it? Um, you know, if you get renewable off of a landfill versus off a digester, your, your contaminants can be different. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we're working through all of that. As you know, with natural gas, um, there's a lot of, of um, energy right now around CCS or the carbon um, capture and storage um, processes. So again, I think it's just going to be important to look at those life cycles and, you know, continue to move to the best options as we as we get the technology out there. But our our primary path right now is electrolysis. Got it. That that's that's fascinating. Um, and I know that there there are a lot of questions on are surrounding this. Um, and okay. so uh, around this this question about how much hydrogen and how you produce it. So I want to go to one from Amanda Simpson. Um, have you made any calculations as to how much solar, so measured in square feet, is required for a, a mile to drive in your uh, fuel cell vehicle? Oh, that's an interesting metric. Um, I would have to say no. Um, we could probably figure it out. So an eight ton station, which is our first, um, that's kind of where we think the economies of scale um, start to make sense right now for on-site is at eight tons. Um, eight tons can support about 200 trucks per day and requires about 22 to 23 megawatts to support. So um, I'm sure I could back into that number. It's an interesting, um, you know, how many watts uh, of solar per mile, but definitely something we could we could look at. Hopefully I gave you enough um, yeah. factors there to put into your calculations. We will email afterwards and maybe we'll try to get an answer to Amanda offline. Um, a, a question from uh, a Global Energy Center senior fellow Bronco Terzic asks um, a very uh, important question. How is hydrogen stored on the truck? Is it compressed or liquefied? It is compressed. It is compressed right now. So um, there are some technologies. So as you look at the pathway, maybe from because I think this is interesting and actually important as we move forward. Um, Right now, if we, when we do it on site, it would be compressed. Um, so compressed into compressed. Um, but there are also options starting to come to the forefront where you could um, produce liquefied, transport it to the station, and then it would still go into the truck compressed. And it is compressed at very high pressures, you know, 10,000 PSI, 700 bar. Um, but the, the kind of long-term goal would be to have liquid on the vehicle because of course that's where you get the energy density and therefore the range for the vehicle um, but that technology just isn't isn't there yet um, but that's definitely something that that we're going to be working towards is liquid on the truck got it well that, that's interesting maybe maybe we'll do another one of these when you can present uh something about that technology when it's ready absolutely um, um, what is what do you see as your biggest initial markets uh, for for the for these trucks, both the electric and the um, and the fuel cell? Are you looking sort of regionally in the United States first? Are you thinking the entire United States? Are you thinking you know Europe, where they are really ambitious about hydrogen? Um, how do you how do you see see this all sort of developing globally? Yeah, um, so. Let me say, so at the, at the highest level, um, our launch markets are North America and Europe. Um, so we'll obviously be launching here and then our partners, um, with our partners of Beko in, in Europe. Um, that said, so if, as I think about the battery electric truck, right, the infrastructure is a little bit different. So literally, if there was someone in Kansas that was interested and wanted to get one truck, you know, they could put a charging station in and you could support that one truck. Um, Will somebody in Kansas want to go that far without incentives? Um, you know, that remains to be seen. Some of the bigger companies that have very ambitious goals, I mean, they're ready to, to implement even where there aren't incentives. Um, but obviously the strongest incentive markets are California and New York right now. Um, we are, you know, again, with that 15 state um, MOU, my guess is we're gonna start to see more um, incentives pop up. And so hopefully, you know, we'll get um, greater, um, 
applications or interest from around the country. Um, on the hydrogen side, it's a little bit different, again, because it's these public fueling stations, right? So you can't, again, if they're supporting 200 trucks, it's harder to just, you're not going to put in a station if there's only one truck of demand. Um, so as we've, Anheuser-Busch is our launch customer. And so our first station will be in support of where their operation is um, in California. And then we'll find vehicles, you know, other companies that, that can work off that same station and then really grow with our customer base. So depending on where, so let's say you can support 20% of their fleet there, right? Well, where's the next 20% going and put a station there and continue to grow. Now, whether or not, um, you know, I don't know if that means we're gonna go west to east, um, but again, because there's um, a lot of interest in New York, there's actually a lot of interest in Texas starting to grow. You know, maybe we'll have the two coasts grow in and from the south. Um, and then, you know, as you mentioned, there's a lot of interest in um, hydrogen in Europe. There's a lot of interest bubbling up in Canada. Um, so I think it's still a little bit to play out. But right now, my guess is our early market will be California. And, um, you know, we'll kind of just see what happens from there. That's fantastic. Now, you use the I word incentive and a number of questions in, in the Q&A are about that. And um, how how much does Nikola's business model depend on um, some sort of government intervention, whether that's incentives or uh, a carbon tax or any sort of policy uh, designed to drive down uh, emissions in the transportation sector? I mean, I would say, Ed, you know, our goal, and we we fully believe that these technologies will be able to compete head to head with um, fossil fuels as we become, you know, more efficient. And by the way, fossil fuels still have subsidies um, and tax credits and things like that um, out there as well. So, so we think all of these, you know, that's our goal is to get to where we don't need incentives. Um, there is, you know, it obviously makes it easier, especially from our customers perspective, if they can get um, some incentives for these vehicles, the capital cost is more um, the upfront cost than traditional vehicles. Um, the TCO we think will compete nicely because, you know, your energy costs, um, these vehicles with an electric drivetrain, they don't have as many parts, they don't have as many moving parts, so we believe maintenance will be lower. Um, and so the TCO should be competitive. But incentives, you know, in, in the early years do definitely help, um, you know, get those technologies out there. Yep, of course. And you've seen that across a range of industries where um, so, some uh, support from uh, from the government, whether you're talking U.S. or Europe or, or wherever, really can help get a nascent industry off the ground. Um, one one final question. We're running out of time. Unfortunately, I feel like we could we could have this conversation for the next hour um, comes from Joel S. Um, and uh, you sort of touched on this um, in your presentation that um, and the conversation that you, um, the the truck the, the fuel cell truck does not send the electricity to the battery but directly to the drivetrain. Um, Joel asks if there's any particular innovation in addition to this that has enabled your business case. Is it you know new fuel cell chemistry, storage technologies? Is there a silver bullet essentially, or really is it this entire package that makes it makes it exciting? I really think it's the entire package. Um, you know, I just think, as I mentioned, you know, between the systems and controls, um, there's a lot of um, advancement in the hydrogen generation side of it. And, you know, as I think about incentives, one of the things that we talk about with government is, you know, there's a lot of focus on on um, the vehicles and the infrastructure, but we also need to look at the generation of the fuel, right? I mean, you can make the, the trucks less expensive and you can subsidize putting in the hard infrastructure, but if your fuel is $10 a gallon equivalent, um, you know, that makes it for a harder case. We also need to look at the fuel, but, um, you know, I think we're just in this crazy, amazing time of, of innovation. And we're, like I said, we're seeing it across the board um, in the vehicles and in the, on the fuel side. So I really do think it's the package. Sorry, that might not be the answer you're hoping for, but um, we're all, yeah, it's just kind of a perfect storm of, of wonderful um, conditions to make it happen. So thank you. That is a fantastic uh, way to close this out. And I, I do apologize that we are out of time and couldn't get to everybody's questions. 
Thank you all for tuning in. And Elizabeth, thank you especially for this. My pleasure. Uh, everyone should be sure to connect with Elizabeth on LinkedIn and send this presentation to your colleagues. It'll be available on the Atlanta Council website, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So uh, please share it. Um, quick note that after, after 20 episodes of Innovation Stream, we're taking a break next week because the Global Energy Center is hosting our annual Veterans Advanced Energy Week, which is a four-day program that brings together a diverse community of veterans, active duty, military spouses, and reservists from around the country to learn about energy security, engage with energy professionals, and access new career opportunities. Um, participants will gain insight into the technology, policy, and economic trends that are driving the global energy transition. So this event, while well, Aim for Veterans is open to the public and we'll have a number of really great panels, including a conversation with Senator Tammy Duckworth on Monday. Wednesday is our Technology Trends Day, so you might also wanna tune into that. More information about Veterans Advanced Energy Week is on the Atlanta Council website. Our next episode of Innovation Stream will be on Friday, August 21st at 12 p.m. Eastern with Caroline Cochran, co-founder and COO of Oaklo a California-based company developing an advanced fission reactor called the Aurora. And it looks, it's really cool. Go look at their website. It looks like it's some sort of well-designed vacation home in the woods. So they really figured out the design elements of it. Um, we'll talk more about the technology on uh, uh, in two weeks. Finally, thank you to all those who helped put this episode together, including Olga Kokova, Emily Burlinghouse, Katie Wimsat, Roger Morales, and Laura Macedo. Um, again, I hope to see you all at Veterans Advanced Energy Week next week and for Oaklo uh, uh, two weeks from now. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you again for joining us. This was really great. We um, really appreciate it and I uh, hope to continue this conversation. Thank you. Thanks everybody out there in Zoom land. Uh, we'll see you all soon.